Um, welcome to the first session of the 2022 Mercy Care Connections Conference, Connecting Our Paths to Wellness. Good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to kick off our annual Connections Conference this year. Thank you all for attending. We have some amazing guest speakers and breakout sessions planned. For the intro, we're going to do things a little bit untraditional this year. We're going to have an intro to the intro to the guest speaker, but bear with me. It will all make sense. So when we were planning the conference this year, I knew who the perfect guest speaker would be after the last two years that we've all had. Someone who's shown incredible strength, bravery, resilience, and used their experience to make tremendous positive impacts to the service delivery system. One of which is the creation of the evidence-based practice personal medicine coaching, which we're thrilled to start this year. Please check out those sessions later for more information. Um, but when we were thinking about doing the personal medicine coaching, I had messaged Pat on LinkedIn and she responded to me and I totally fangirled. I think I texted everyone I knew that she responded to me. But the first time that I ever heard about our guest speaker was from Elisa Randall. Elisa currently serves as the assistant director to, she's got a long title, Division of Grants at Access and is one of the strongest advocates and most compassionate people that I know. So about 12 years ago, I had worked at the Park North Health Home and it had closed down and it had merged with the Townley Clinic and Elisa was the site administrator over at Townley. As part of her acclimation to the Townley Clinic, she, she not only took us on a tour of the clinic, right, but she also acclimated us to the mission of the Townley Clinic. And that mission was to create hope in a recovery environment which supports our members' goals, dreams, and aspirations. And that's when she told us about Pat. Pat's story has not only empowered me as a family member, but it has also helped shape me as a social worker. So with that, I wanna hand it over to Lisa and thank Access for your continued collaboration and helping us make this conference possible each year. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. Can you all hear me? I was having technology issues earlier, so thumbs up. Okay, good. So thank you, Christy, and thank you, Mercy Care, for allowing me a few minutes to speak today at your Connections Conference. For those of you who don't know me, I had the ultimate pleasure of working at Mercy Care since the beginning of their REBA contract back in 2014 and was there until 2019 when I moved over to Access. But in 2014, that was the first year that the first connect the Connections Conference happened. So I can tell you and I can attest to the amount of work that Mercy Care puts into this. And I am so happy to be included even now in my current role with Access. As Christy alluded to, today's keynote speaker made an impact on me personally and professionally many years ago. More years than I think I want to really attest to, but I will. Um, I think it was back in 2000, and I was a new team lead back with uh, previous REBA, a few previous REBAs ago, Value Options. And I was lucky enough to hear Dr. Deegan speak to a group of us about recovery and stigma. Up until this time, I had only been educated on the medical model, and her presentation is still something that I vividly remember to this day. My eyes were opened, and from then on, I knew where we had to go as a system in Arizona, but especially as an individual who provided direct care. Her words are with me even now as someone who has the opportunity to develop new opportunities for services in our state. I know that when you hear her speak today, you will walk away with the same desire to do what is right and for the right reasons. My personal hope, and I know that Christy shares this with me, is that you will walk away today determined to share her message with those that could not hear it and that you continue to push her message to the masses because that is what we will need to help us move things forward here in Arizona and for those who need it the most. Patricia Deegan, PhD, is a founder of Pat Deegan and Associates. For over 30 years, Pat has been a thought leader and disruptive innovator in the field behavioral health recovery. Pat founded a company run by and for people in recovery. The mission to safeguard human dignity by bringing individual voice and choice to the center of the clinical care team, which really speaks quite well to what Mercy Care is about and what we hope Arizona will consistently push. Toward this end, she developed Pat Deegan's recovery approach that includes the award-winning Common Ground software, medication empowerment, the online recovery library, the Common Ground Academy for Peers and Practitioners, and the Hearing Distressing Voices simulation. 
Since 2009, Pat has worked as a consultant helping to develop and evolve the OnTrack New York model for coordinated specialty care teams for young folks experiencing early psychosis. Pat is an activist in the disability rights movement and has lived her own journey of recovery after being diagnosed with schizophrenia as a teenager. She has held a number of academic appointments, has numerous publications, and has carried a message of hope for recovery to audiences around the world. She received her doctorate in clinical psychology from Duquesne University, and it is my honor to introduce you to Dr. Patricia Deegan. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for kind introductions. It's an honor to have this opportunity to speak with you today. I um, uh, have prepared some remarks, but just want to begin by uh, saying um, happy Juneteenth. Uh, we are learning from our history, have a long way to go, but we're on the move, and that's a good sign, I think. So happy June 13th. And let me also preface my remarks today by saying that I think we've been through some extraordinary, and continue to go through some extraordinary and unprecedented times here in the United States. These have been uh, uh, times full, filled with a, a lot of challenges. Uh, for those of us working uh, in any setting, including behavioral health. And I just want to say that I have been truly impressed at the way um, the behavioral health workforce, parents, individuals receiving services, we've all had to pivot in new and exciting ways, I think, um, in order to um, continue to support our mental health through these very trying times. Um, we've all gotten very, very good at WebExing and Zooming and uh, meeting meeting virtually. And there are some aspects to it which are kind of really cool that we're getting to, to, to meet, I think, more often uh, in places where perhaps we wouldn't have um, otherwise been able to meet. So I guess that's the silver lining uh, and that uh, I am uh, uh, pleased to say also that I, particularly I've, I've seen that the peer workforce the workforce of paid peer specialists around the country and really all over the world really pivoting and doing some extraordinarily innovative work uh, during um, these uh, challenging times, making sure that our peers are getting the support and services uh, that they need. And so um, that's a wonderful thing too. And I, and I like to ask the question, you know, um, uh, you know, why do you do this work? Why do you come to work in the morning. And I can say with a fair amount of certainty that uh, when we come to work in the morning, those of us who've stayed longer than six months, seven months <laughs> in the job, it's not because of the paycheck. And that's not to say that money's important with the price of gas these days, you better get some, have some money coming in, right? Uh, and yet it's really not about the paycheck uh, because frankly, there are a lot easier ways to, uh, to make a living. Uh, but we choose to do this work. And each and every day we come back, we affirm that choice. So I ask myself, well, why do we uh, do this work? What brings us back? Why will you come back tomorrow? And I think uh, as I've reflected on this question uh, for uh, many uh, years now, I think what I'm learning is that um, we do this work uh, because we are uh, committed, uh, we have a sense of our own why. I think we have a sense of, of why. And my sense is th that each of us have been through a kind of passage in our lives. Uh, each of us have hit a point in our lives where perhaps life knocked us down in ways we hadn't anticipated. Maybe we grew up in an alcoholic home, or maybe we lost a loved one or had a miscarriage, or maybe we've faced uh, serious um, uh, health challenges ourselves, or um, maybe uh, we ourselves have had to um, discover our own sobriety and make that journey. Whatever it was that came along in your life, I think the reason we can stick with the work we do and remain devoted to it is because life did knock us down. And maybe for a while, we thought, maybe I can't get back up. And yet somehow we did. Somehow we were able um, to get back up. And, and instead of being destroyed by this adversity, we were 
uh, transformed by it. It's as if we kind of made a passage, a passage through a, a, a difficult time, a fiery time, but rather than beginning consumed by it, we came out the other side um, new and in many ways transformed, right? Perhaps we came out the other side with a deep sense of, of compassion for others who've also gotten knocked down or experiencing a kind of, I don't know if I can make this, but whatever it is that you've been through, and I don't know the particulars for each and every one of you, of course, but whatever it is, I know the reason that you can come back to work tomorrow and the next day and the next day is because you have been changed through the, your own passage and now you're carrying a gift. I don't care if you're a psychiatrist, a peer specialist, um, a social worker, um, you're carrying a gift born of your own lived experience, born of your own triumph, if you will, um, in and through adversity, um, and came out the other side with a message of hope. And the important thing about hope is hope is really, really different than cheerleading. Um, you know, or optimism. I think optimism is shallow and very flighty. It's more like a cheerleading mentality. Oh, don't worry, be happy. You can do it. Yeah, yeah, you can recover. You'll be okay. And frankly, that's unhelpful because really what it does is it leaves the person who may be in anguish, it leaves the person who may be struggling all on their own as we race ahead and say, well, I know what the future's gonna be and it's gonna be okay. Well, the truth is we don't know that, right? That's flighty optimism, right? I much prefer having our work be grounded in hope. Hope is the realization that the future is fundamentally unknown and it's ambiguous. And I don't know what your future or mine for that matter is going to be tomorrow or the next day. But what I can do with a hope filled heart is to stand with a person who's struggling, who's in anguish, who's suffering today and say, I am willing to walk with you into tomorrow. And there will be a tomorrow as we make that road by walking it together. And that's really what recovery ultimately is all about. Recovery means having a hope-filled spirit that we bring to the work each and every day. That's the gift that we carry. And that's the gift that we want to cultivate here in our conspiracy of hope, as I will be talking about uh, today. Uh, I've uh, dug out of the, the vault a talk that I wrote a very, very long time ago in the late 1980s, uh, uh, and I've updated it and, of course, Im improved it, I hope. Uh, and uh, and made it right for, for WebEx, I think. But let's get going. I mean, recovery, a conspiracy of hope. And thanks again uh, for all it is that you do. So let me start uh, with a very simple definition. Recovery is not necessarily about, you know, a kind of rocket science or something. I think one of the most concise and realistic definitions of, of recovery I've heard is that for some, recovery means having a job, a paycheck, and a date on a Friday night. That's not about a clinical status, a clinical remission, a this or a that, a big wig thing, no. It's about having the life that I want. Recovery is a, a journey, it's a pathway into the life that I want for myself. Um, a lot of people want to be able to work and contribute to our communities and get paid a decent wage for that, right? And the sense of working means to contribute, means to be part of something. Um, that is benefiting all. I'm um, having a paycheck, having uh, the opportunity to participate in the, um, you know, fiscal commerce of a local community is a powerful uh, testament to being a member of that community. I think a lot of times in behavioral health, we get mixed up about community. And a lot of times community is sort of gets this weird meaning of that place that's outside of the hospital. Well, that's not community. You know that place outside the hospital where Walmart is? That's not community. You can be as lonely and as institutionalized in a single room occupancy all by yourself staring at TikTok all day on a, on a phone. That's institutionalization for some, right? Being a member of community means having that uh, communion, that relationship, that nexus of interconnectedness with others in my community. That's what 
real community is about, right? And love, a date on a Friday night, someone special, someone I look forward to, to being with, right? So this, I think, is a great, great definition uh, of recovery. So that's really what our theme is today. We're going to be talking about recovery, but I want to begin by reading to you a reflection, because I think sometimes we remember metaphors and little stories as well as we might remember facts. So let me just share this reflection. And for those of you, I'm, I'm coming, I'm beaming in from Massachusetts, by the way, I'm here in my home office in Massachusetts and, um, uh, and it's still spring here. We don't turn to summer till tomorrow. So this reflection has to do with a reflection on, on spring. So it's springtime and hope is everywhere. It's springtime, and it feels like all living things are trembling into being, still wet and new, fragile, and determined to put down roots and grow. I think of a sea rose I watched growing out of the beach near my home one past summer. It's a fragile and tender life, that sea flower, and I love to see it. At dawn, it moves in a slow upswing as it turns toward the morning star. That sea rose is a light seeker. It bends towards the light. It is a light seeker whose roots reach way down into the darkness of the earth. In fact, it was in darkness that this new life began. Way back in January and February, when the icy winds lashed across those dunes and the days were short and the light gave no warmth, even then, way down under the ground, this new life was waiting. Nobody could see it. Nobody was there to witness it. And yet, this promise of a sea flower awaited. It waited in that icy darkness for the sands to begin to thaw. It waited for the rains to come and loosen the earth. And then, ever so slowly, it began to stir. Moving one grain of sand at a time, it began to grow. Now, it did not grow straight towards the light at first. No. First, its growth sought a downward course, reaching, stretching, blindly groping through shifting sands to find a solid place, a place to be rooted, a good soil to cling to and to be nurtured by, a home soil that could sustain it even in driving rains and tormenting winds. And then, having rooted itself in this way, the sea rose began its journey toward the light. Poking through the darkness, that sea flower emerged tiny and lovely and insistent and courageous. On frail and trembling limbs, this small thing rose to a new life. And for me, that sea rose teaches us a lot about hope. It teaches us that hope emerges out of darkness. It teaches us that hope can grow in nurturing environments that allow one to become rooted and secure. And I've come here today to celebrate that hope symbolized by the sea rose. And I do believe it's a spirit of hope that gathers us here today. We are family members and psychiatrists and nurses and psychologists, researchers, social workers. We're individuals who use services, right? And traditionally, you never would have caught us in the same room together. We all used to stick to our respective disciplines, but something's going on here. Something is changing. Something is shifting. And I'd like to ask, what is going on here? Are the old rules being broken? Are the old silos crumbling? 
Is the old order shaking a bit at the foundation? Is there a conspiracy going on? <laughs> I love the word conspiracy. It comes from the Latin conspirare, which means to breathe the spirit together. So what is the spirit we are breathing together here today? It's a spirit of hope. Both individually and collectively, we have refused to succumb to the images of despair that are so often associated with serious mental illness. We are a conspiracy of hope and we are pressing back against the strong tide of prejudice, which for centuries has been the legacy of those of us who've been diagnosed with mental illness. We are refusing to reduce human beings to illnesses. We recognize that within each of us, there is a person and that as people, we share a common humanity. And of course, as the Sea Rose, Rose teaches us, we are learning that the environment around people must change if we're to be expected to grow into the fullness of the person who, like a small seed, is waiting to emerge from within us. So I ask you, if we plant a seed in a desert and it fails to grow, do we ask what is wrong with the seed? No. The real conspiracy lays in this to look at the environment around the seed and to ask what must change in this environment such that the seed can grow. The real conspiracy that we're participating in here today is to stop asking what's wrong with people diagnosed with serious mental illness and to start asking how do we create hope-filled, humanized environments in which people can grow? That's the question. But before speaking further of hope and recovery, I want to share with you what it's like to be diagnosed at a young age with mental illness and to lose all hope. So my story begins uh, at around the age of 17 years old. I was a senior at Marshfield High School here in Massachusetts. And, uh, you know, as a high schooler, um, and basically truth is for all my life, I was a really good athlete. I loved to play sports and three varsity sports. And if it had a ball and a competitive edge, I was, I was in. Uh, that said, I was um, not at all gifted academically. And uh, I was that kind of perfect C minus <clears throat> GPA that allowed me to continue to uh, make my uh, varsity teams, but at the same time, didn't require uh, too terribly much effort. Uh, so if you'd ever said that I'd be lecturing to folks in Arizona today over, over web, I would have said, nah, that's, that's not me. Uh, because my hope and my dream and my aspiration for my life at the time was to figure out a way to get paid uh, to play sports. And I figured one good way to do that would be to become a women's um, coach at the college level. Um, so, uh, right in the midst of that, and you all remember senior year in high school, and it's all about the future, and people are asking you, what are you going to do, what are you going to be? And so there it is, the winter break um, uh, uh, of my senior year, and I was, of course, at basketball practice with my team over the break, and I began to have uh, some very unusual and very distressing uh, experiences. Um, I began to hear distressing voices that uh, other people were not hearing uh, that said very cruel and derogatory and uh, kind of awful things about me. And I had no sense that uh, others uh, uh, were immune to those messages, that they could perhaps hear them too. Um, I began, as I remember on the, on the, the basketball court, the first thing I remember getting off was that I, I like lost my coordination and my depth perception went and I couldn't like locate myself in terms of my proprioceptive bodily feedback in space. I, I just didn't know where I was on the court very well. And 
my coach noticed that I was off and she said, Pat, why don't you, <clears throat> why don't you go on in and take the rest of the day off? And so I, so I did, I, I, um, I uh, went into the locker room and uh, having a rough time and finally made my way home. And over the next few days, things continued to get worse. And I began locking myself and barricading myself in the bedroom, which was frightening my brothers and sisters. And um, it just became a, a very, very terrifying time. I was wondering, uh, I remember my mother talking to me and wondering how flat-headed screwdrivers had been substituted for her teeth. And it was just really, really frightening. And needless to say, as this went on for some time, the adults around me began to take notice of my distress and began to um, think about what to do. And the decision was made to have me admitted to a psychiatric hospital. So um, I was admitted uh, to a psychiatric hospital. And once admitted, um, I was interviewed by a clinical team um, led by a couple of uh, senior psychiatrists at this teaching hospital where I had been admitted. And I was told, and these are the exact words, Ms. Deegan, you have a disease called schizophrenia. Uh, just like uh, schizophrenia is a disease that's a lot like diabetes, just like a diabetic will have to take insulin for the rest of their lives, you're going to have to take high dose antipsychotic medications for the rest of your life. And at discharge, um, I was told, um, Ms. Deegan, you need to take your meds, take your meds, take your meds. And did we mention take your meds religiously? And Somehow, I was um, also supposed to avoid stress, but definitely they were very, very clear that in terms of avoiding stress, uh, my job was simply um, no love, no romance, no school, no college. Uh, forget all of those things because um, that is um, uh, gone now. That that can't be your life now. Now you need to take medications and avoid stress because you're vulnerable to stress. And you know, in those early days, when I was uh, told this, I was compliant. I went back home from the hospital and I sat in a, on a chair in my uh, family's living room uh, and I used the medications as prescribed. And you know, there's no doubt about it that heavy doses of antipsychotic medications did tend to muffle my experience uh, in terms of the voices. The voices didn't go away, um, but the voices were more muffled uh, and my um, frightening thoughts um, about that perhaps somebody was switching people or something. I didn't quite know all of what was going on, but I was very suspicious and frightened trying to understand what, what was changing. And uh, uh, the fear seemed to be dulled more. Um, and certainly I could sleep better um, when I was on these medications. It wasn't really like sleep. It was just like kind of hitting the bed and passing out. Um, uh, so these distressing experience didn't go away on medications, but they became more muffled, which meant that I, I wasn't shouting at my voices anymore. I wasn't... Um, uh, pounding on a wall anymore. I wasn't barricading the door anymore. Um, and so people around me were much less disturbed. Uh, but my own experience internally was still of being, um, you know, not myself and certainly um, uh, uh, very over medicated. Um, but um, uh, these less troubling symptoms really seem to be to be worth it. Um, for, for the team anyway, and, and for my family, because my behavior was uh, more controlled. Um, and so I began to kind of slide into what I call the Coke and smoke syndrome, right? I began to slide into this experience of um, uh, really just uh, sitting all day long, uh, smoking cigarettes, drinking high test Coca-Cola, um, staring into space, and I was so sedated and I was so emotionally numb um, that not only like was my disorganized thinking gone, but basically my thinking altogether was gone that, uh, you know, uh, my thoughts weren't, my, or what I call delusional thoughts weren't bothering me, but the truth is nothing was bothering me at all. 
um, uh, because I was not feeling much. I was somnolent. I slept a lot. Um, I remember one time my best friend, Kathy, came by. She was nervous. She came by to see me. And I remember looking at a watch and saying, it's 8 o'clock. You need to go. I'm going to bed. And that's really, I didn't care. I just didn't, I just, I just wanted to go to bed. And then when I got up, uh, sit in a chair, drinking Coca-Cola and smoking cigarettes because I had picked up cigarette smoking. And it was funny because this thing about smoking cigarettes, it really was helpful in the sense of um, it just felt like I could mark the passing of time. It was something to do. Um, and so uh, at this point, I can honestly say I was kind of living out my life in what I call handicaptivity. Um, and I felt um, uh, that I was living in a kind of chemical um, hibernation um, that left me very isolated uh, from my world and very alienated from myself. And every, at first every other week and then every month, I would go back into Boston to the ambulatory care clinic at the hospital that I had been inpatient in. And I would meet with members of my team from all different kinds of disciplines. And um, when we met, when I look back on those meetings, there was an incredible chasm between what I was experiencing and um, the other um, members of the team. So um, here's a visual on, on that. So when I would go in, you know, I might say something to the effect of, I feel sedated. But my teams had a very different perspective on this. They would say, well, Miss Deegan, you're not as psychotic. And I would say, but I still hear these distressing voices. And they would say, but Miss Deegan, you're not shouting at your voices anymore. And I'd say something to the effect of, well, I can't think clearly when I'm on this medicine. And they would say, no, no, you're not thought disordered when you take this um, medicine. And I said, well, I feel like the meds are controlling me. And they would say, oh, no, you are more in control, right? And I would in some way express, hey, I'm not myself anymore. And they would say, you've returned to baseline, Ms. Deegan. So I hope you can almost visually see here in this slide the chasm uh, between uh, myself and my team. They're literally and I mean, quite literally, is no common ground here. No common ground on which the members of my team and myself were standing, having a shared vision of where treatment was supposed to be going. The emphasis is solely on symptom suppression. Symptom suppression, symptom suppression, right? And honestly, I lost years of my life uh, in this state of the coke and smoke syndrome or handicaptivity, I call it sometimes. Um, and I would argue that this is not ancient history. You know, we can still go out there in our current service systems and find people who are in a state of, um, uh, of just simply kind of stabilization and maintenance, but really are not living the life that they want to, to get to. Um, and uh, I believe that at the root of it is this kind of chasm, this kind of chasm between the individual's perspective and our um, perspective as clinicians. Well, as I said, I lost years of my life in this netherworld. And what was um, interesting is, uh, although in no way could you say I was recovering, but in some peculiar way, I was perceived as a treatment success. So my, remember my treatment team um, um, uh, telling my parents, you know, about three indicators of, of treatment success. There's reduced healthcare costs because I wasn't using high-end um, services like emergency room services. Uh, my treatment resulted, therefore, in uh, reduced cost success, um, reduced recidivism. I wasn't going back to the hospital and increased community tenure. These are still metrics by which we measure, okay, um, success. And yet, even though uh, I didn't have a life, the life I knew was over. 
And there was no better life, no pathway into a better life looming for me, right? I was now disabled by the treatment. I definitely felt that the treatment was worse than um, psychosis. As I look back, at least psychosis was exciting and highly energized, right? Right? But this was just nothingness, just nothingness. And people were happy for me. And my family was being told that this was success, right? Me, the person, had sort of shriveled up and atrophied. I had developed comorbidities. I had gained a lot of weight, as so many people to this day do uh, on uh, medications. Um, and all of this led uh, to a profound sense of despair. I felt like I was given a prognosis of doom. The prognosis being that I would live out my life maintained, stabilized, steady, uh, but avoiding stress, but really no life. That, that a generic future had been substituted for the future I wanted, for the life that I wanted. Um, I didn't see any way, and the treatment environment I was in didn't offer any pathway out into the life that I wanted for myself. Now, this treatment approach that I'm describing is called the maintenance model. And again, I wish I could say that the maintenance model was ancient history, but it's not. We can still find many instances of the maintenance model uh, out in modern psychiatric uh, and behavioral health care today. So this um, uh, maintenance model is characterized by the belief that serious mental illnesses are chronic diseases from which people cannot get well. They tend to be hospital-based care, right? And they tend to um, have the expectation that people will be out of hospitals for a while and will return and be out of hospitals and, and, and will return. And in systems that I would call maintenance model systems, they're very different than recovery-oriented um, models, uh, systems, but in maintenance model sim uh, systems, um, the emphasis was on um, but what I heard one social worker refer to as meds, manners, and money, right? So ask yourself as you're hearing this in terms of the service system that you may work in or be uh, um, utilizing services in, is there a lot of emphasis on meds, manners, and money to the exclusion of other important things? In systems that are maintenance model, um, there tends to be an emphasis uh, on supervised congregate living. Um, people kind of being stabilized and maintained, but not really living great lives. Their lives tend to be devoid of meaning and purpose. Uh, we tend in these systems to segregate people um, in day activity programs of sorts. So for instance, rather than taking a pottery course at the local community college, which would at least offer the opportunity for real community integration, we find that people are segregated in uh, a day kind of day program, day activity program, uh, where they do pottery uh, instead. And there's also a strong expectation that folks are gonna be on benefit checks for the rest of their lives. And so you have it, that's maintenance. Um, and on the surface, you know, the maintenance model seems to make good sense. You think to yourself, oh, okay, well, you know, there are folks who are vulnerable and who are hurting and having a rough time and it makes sense to protect people. And it makes sense to, um, you know, ensure that they're getting all of their, all of their basics. Um, so there's a level in which, at least from an intuitive perspective, a maintenance model seems to make sense. But then uh, we've got important studies, very important studies that show us that this is actually a fallacy. So for instance, um, in a very famous study that was done by Michael DeSisto and Dr. Courtney Harding, it was called the Vermont, uh, Maine Vermont study. Uh, we had two mental health systems, one Vermont, and at the time the Vermont system was based on rehabilitation models, uh, and there was the expectation that people would become self-sufficient in work, and the expectation that people would live in, quote, real integrated housing, not segregate, congregate housing, group homes, et cetera, transitional group homes, et cetera. Right? Whereas, so that's the Vermont system. And then there was the main system. And that system was based on a stabilization model, like we've described. There was the expectation that people would remain on benefits for life and couldn't work. 
And there was the expectation that people needed to be monitored and supervised and congregate housing um, for, for life, right? And yet, if you looked at the outcomes, so we had two matched samples of people who were leaving um, the state's uh, uh, state hospital system in both states, matched samples, right? And they were followed for the better part of 20 years in terms of what outcomes. And given the maintenance model, we'd expect that the Vermonters uh, would have had a harder time because they were exposed to more stress. They were living in the real world. They were not protected um, necessarily. Um, where we would have expected Maine to have a much more uh, robust outcome. And yet, when we look at the outcomes over a 16 year period of time, we find that uh, the rate of recidivism, the rate of returning to the hospital, for people in board and care and staff board and care houses and group homes, 50% over a period of 16 years, okay? And folks in Vermont were only returning um, at 13%, at right? So what is the big message here? And I think that the big me message here is that boredom, having nothing to do, having no reason to get up in the morning is stressful. And my team didn't understand that. Okay, but it is. Boredom is profoundly stressful, right? Having meaning and purpose, a reason to get out of bed in the morning, these are the things that, that give us life, okay? And that focus us on purpose, right? And that help people actually stay out of the hospital, right? So if we compare the maintenance model, right, to the recovery model, what we find is that in the recovery model, we have hope for individual recovery, and we don't talk about chronic illnesses from which no one gets better. Right? Instead, we talk about hope for recovery, and that's not flighty optimism. Don't worry, you can recover. I don't know that, but I have hope that we can walk into the pathway to your recovery together. I'm here to support you. Stabilization. It's overrated, I think. What people really want is a life outside of the system, not to get stabilized and stuck in handicaptivity. Be a passive recipient of care. Well, in the recovery model, people have to get activated. We got to get empowered to get our lives back on track, right? The focus in a recovery model is not solely on symptom reduction. It really is on work, school, strengths, and interests. From day one, we pursue goals from day one. We don't defer goals. We don't wait till the person gets better and then let them, uh, you know, make a, a goal. But rather, we ask from day one, okay, what's your goal? How do you want treatment to help you? Where do you want to get to? What does the life you want look like? And if I had to summarize the whole shift between the maintenance model and the recovery model, I would say that the shift is we take the focus off of what's the matter with you and put the focus on what matters to you. And once as clinicians, once we understand what matters to you, we're on our way. We're on our way. Right? All of the treatment plan, all of the support we offer is geared toward helping you get to what matters to you. That's what's reflected in the care plan and the treatment plan. What matters to you and how can we at Mercy Care help you, support you in getting there. So I offer you some posters, some memes, or whatever we want to call them. My dreams are the stars that guide my journey of recovery, and I will trust my dreams to lead me. Right? Now, these are going to be, these posters, most of them are going to be in your, your handouts. And they're available to you in English, and, and many are also available in Spanish. And I want you to put these everywhere, right? And they're as much a reminder for staff and for families as they are for individuals, right? That we don't wait until people are all better to start asking them, what do you want to do with your life? We ask from day one. Where in your care pathway do we ask the question, what matters to you? What are your dreams? Too often I hear, well, we can't, we can't let people shoot for their dreams because then they'll have too far to fall. Okay, that's toxic help, my friends. That's, that's help that hurts. That's not helpful, right? Yes, it may take months or years to get 
to my hope and my dream. But I don't believe there's any such thing as an unrealistic dream. I just think our dreams eventually um, become like a fit for our lives. And it's not too big and not too small. It just becomes who I am. Another one I think is really powerful. Let's move mercy care system from what's the matter with you to what matters to you. Once we know that, once we know that, uh, we know a lot and can really begin to work with that individual. Okay. Well, when last I mentioned it, I was there on the couch, smoking cigarettes, staring through nicotine space for all intents and purposes and disheveled. Um, I had trouble with my hygiene, wasn't brushing my teeth, my hair was a wreck, um, overweight, loose fitting clothing, just really looking like 18, but 105 all at the same time, you know? There I was, and day in and day out, and day in and day out. And there was one thing that happened every day, and her name was my grandmother, <laughs> my nanny, right? Every day, uh, she would come into this uh, room that I was sitting in, into my smoke-filled reality, and she'd say, Patricia, would you like to go food shopping? And I'd say, no. And she'd turn around and she'd leave. The next day, she'd come back in, same voice, I'll never forget it. Patricia, would you like to go food shopping? Nope. Right? And I should have got suspicious because she would come on on Sundays when the, <laughs> the supermarket wasn't even open. But she was a wise, wise old woman. And then one day, for reasons that I can't account for, I said yes. And I added the caveat that I would only push the cart, I wouldn't put a damn thing in it, <laughs> you know, but I would go. And I've looked back on that moment and with true humility, just saying that's where my journey of recovery began, pushing a cart down the aisle of an A&P supermarket in Cohasset, Massachusetts, right? And not putting one thing in it. <laughs> so what is it that my grandmother knew? What did she know? And looking back on it, I, I think what she knew is that a no from yesterday and the day before doesn't mean a no for today. And that really what she was doing was she was walking into my nicotine-stained, hermetically sealed, smoky world every day and literally opening the door, some fresh air comes in, and guess what? She just... Um, says, there's a possibility, Patricia. I can't carry you over the threshold. I can't make you do this. What I can do, as your grandmother, I can invite you. And I have hope because I'll come back the next day and I'll invite you again. I'll invite you again. And thank God she did. Thank God she did because I said yes one day and I don't know why. Okay, but I use this understanding that there's um uh, she was changing the environment if you think of me as the sea rose okay i wasn't growing i was in that dark place under the earth she was coming in and watering me every day she was saying what about today something new what about today and what's really important is if she had gotten down on me or she had given me a lecture or she forget it i would have shut down okay but she didn't she just said come come see there's a new world, Pat. There's a new world for you, Trisha. You, 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 can, you can come. And I did. Okay. Now, clearly, there was a lot, lot more steps. We don't have time for them all today. But I will tell you another incredibly powerful turning point for me. Okay. And this turning point had to do with stumbling into self-care. Now, I know that some of you weren't even born <laughs> when the good old mighty Sony Walkman was a was a personal uh, a, a personal entertainment revolution. 
but some of you may have heard of analog tapes. And with the right equipment, you could mix your own playlist onto a hissy old analog tape. And uh, not only that, but my Sony Walkman had a built-in AM FM radio as well, a personal headset, and it could go with you. It wasn't like having an old stereo that <laughs> didn't go anywhere, right? This was amazing to me, that, you know, this, this Sony Walkman. And I got one during this time of the Coke and Smoke syndrome and after I had been out with my grandmother that time. Anyway, um, I remember uh, hearing these voices that were very distressing. And then all of a, a sudden, I decided to put on my headset. I don't know what prompted me to do it. And it was this extraordinary experience because when I put on uh, my Sony Walkman, and was listening to some tunes that I cared about, the voices, they didn't go away completely, but they faded. They faded um, so that uh, it was as if I could suddenly switch my focus a little bit. In other words, the thing about hearing voices, it's not that they're super loud necessarily. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes they only mumble, but they do have a presence to them. Voices, I think for most of us, distressing voices, grab us uh, by the gut. They grab us effectively and don't let go. Um, and they um, seem to have this presence to them of being all knowing, kind of all powerful, all seeing. And it can be really difficult to shake that, right? Even though they might be very, very quiet, right? So here I am, I'm starting to have these very distressing voices and I put my headset on and these uh, suddenly I can shift my attention from the voices to the lyrics to this tune that I really liked. How did that happen? I mean, I had never, ever, ever been told, Miss Deacon, there are things you can do to help yourself. No one, no one mentioned it. <laughs> I literally stumbled into it, but whoa, it was like dawn breaks on marble head. Wow, this is amazing. Wow, I can do something. I can do something. Everything changed. Total game changer. So it won't be surprising to you that a central part of my work over the last 30 years has been evolving this idea that there are things that come from within us that we can learn to do to help ourselves. And I've come to call that personal medicine. Personal medicines are self-initiated, non-pharmaceutical, meaning they're not drugs. They're self-initiated, non-pharmaceutical self-care strategies that serve to give us meaning and purpose in our lives and that help diminish distress. Okay. Personal medicines, they're the things we can do that put a smile on our face and bring joy and meaning to our lives. This is Simon, right? Caring for his beloved dog is a source of joy in his life and no therapist told him to go get a dog. Simon knew this himself, right? Caring for his beloved dog is a source of joy in his life and caring for the dog gives Simon who struggles with depression a reason to get up every single morning, right? And it connects him because he has to take the dog out in the community, it connects him with other community members who wave to him and reach out to greet his pup every day when he walks by. The dog connects, is powerful personal medicine and connects Simon to his world, helps him get out of bed and get a head start before his depression wakes up for the day. Wow, bottle that up. That's powerful medicine, right? Now, importantly, personal medicine is not what we take. So personal medicine is not some homemade concoction of a little St. John's wort with rum <laughs> added, right? That, no, 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 no. That is not personal medicine. It's not what we take, right? Personal medicine is not smoking cigarettes and taking in the nick. No, not what we take. It's what we do to get well and stay well. And you know what's interesting about personal medicine? It can't be prescribed for me. 
It comes from the healer within me. Right? It can't be prescribed for me. And we've done research over the last years on personal medicine. And we've discovered that uh, the use of personal medicine uh, in people who use it actually increases over time. So just like what happened to me, sort of naturalistically in my own life, when I discovered the Sony Walkman, I wanted to discover other things that I could do that would increase my wellness and help me get to what the life I wanted, right? Well, the same is true with other people. When they discover their initial personal medicines, typically that tends to grow. Um, and that when people are using personal medicine, it creates this activation, which is the pathway into recovery. And this activation in self-care has been shown in many studies um, to also improve overall health outcomes. Right? Today, these are some of my personal medicines. And I'll tell you, my life has, has grown in ways I never thought possible, I never dreamed of. Okay, I, I didn't get to become that women's lacrosse coach. It didn't happen for me. And, you know, that was something that I, I let go of eventually. I'm still very active, love to work out, still love to ski, but I don't um, regret because my life today is filled with new and wondrous kinds of personal medicine, right? So you see a picture here of, of raspberries. Now, why are raspberries personal medicine? Well, we cultivate raspberries, my partner Deborah and I, out in the backyard, right? And they usually come to fruition in uh, July, August, September, some even till later in October. Anyway, I'll be upstairs here working, and you know, I'm multitasking 100 miles an hour, and noontime comes, and what I do, is I got to get out of my head. So what do I do? On those months, I'll go out and I'll pick raspberries. And I'll tell you something, raspberries are really good teachers. And for those of you who don't pick raspberries, they, they have thorny uh, stems. And if I'm multitasking while picking berries, I walk away with bloody fingers because you can't multitask when you're picking a berry. You have to pick one and then another and you can't do six at a time, right? One, then another, then another. So it's a great teacher because it brings me right out of my head to concentrate on each and every berry. And that I discovered was powerful medicine for me. I'm not, not taking an Ativan to de-stress uh, in the middle of my day. I'm going out to pick raspberries. Raspberries are powerful personal medicine because they help me get out of my head and to slow down and to take it one berry at a time. And I'm able to return to work in the afternoon, uh, ready to go. My partner, Deborah, I mentioned, we've been together for way too long, right? We've been together, I don't know, about 30 years or something. And I never thought I could, could, could be with somebody. You see my wood stacks, I'm very proud of these. We, we uh, burn uh, wood um, uh, and, uh, you know, I think, uh, my, I got my I got my wood stacking idea off of uh, off of YouTube, and I'm loving my new method. And uh, but again, it's that same thing of the one log at a time, one log at a time, one log at a time. It slows me down. It gets concrete. It gets physical. It helps me stay grounded. Very very powerful medicine. And I'm not talking about a metaphor. It literally is medicine. That um, that uh, stacking wood is powerful medicine. Medicine can be what we do. Medicine can be what we do. Exercise has been shown to be a powerful antidepressant with a very large effect size. Work, especially when we help people um, develop uh, an interest in work and go through uh, individual placement and support for supported employment, work is powerful medicine that gives meaning and purpose to life and helps people move out of mental health systems into the life that they want. We have, I think, 28 randomized controlled trials, the gold standard of modern research that shows that work works. So where in our systems of care are our supported employment 
programs. We need them. Work is powerful medicine. And most people who want to work are not working. If you have a mental health diagnosis, we know how to change that. Let's fund what really works, right? One other thing here, my daughter Cheyenne. You know, I never thought I could be a parent, right? And yet here's our daughter Cheyenne, 25 years old, working currently as a barista, living independently over in Salem, Massachusetts. I mean, wow, life can be beautiful, bring joy and meaning and purpose to my life. So a few more memes that sort of capture the spirit and the essence of what I'm saying here. First off, recovery is a story of go is not a story of going back to who I used to be. It's a story of becoming something new. And I love I love this because um, I really thought in the beginning. And I know my family hoped that I would, after taking psychiatric meds and getting psychiatric treatment and therapy, that I would go back to being the athlete. Okay, but that's more of a story of restoration. It's about, oh, I need to go back to who I used to be. But the truth is that for many, many, many of us, that's not at all the recovery narrative, the recovery story. Recovery is about becoming something new, becoming something I had never anticipated, that I had never even maybe dreamed of before. It's powerful recovery. It's a journey very often that involves not going back to baseline, becoming someone new, becoming something new. A fundamental all our services have to embrace this fundamental principle. The folks we're working with, I'm a person. I'm not an illness. Okay, remember these are in Spanish too, okay? I'm a person, not an illness. That's where all the work begins. And the good news is that illnesses do not recover, but people do. We do not work with illnesses. We do not treat illnesses. We work with and co-create health <clears throat> with the people uh, who we're serving. And that's good news. Illnesses don't recover, but people do. That's where the hope is, my friends. That's where the hope is. And here's a video I made with Missy and uh, Lizzie Sheehan that kind of says it all. I'm going to play it for you. So, you are diagnosed with a mental illness. You're not alone. Many of us have faced mental health challenges and have passed through them to live a wonderful life. You can too. For a minute, imagine you are a flower. There you were living your life before you were diagnosed. You had your friends, family, your hopes and dreams. Maybe you were working or going to school. Perhaps you had a hobby, played sports, or cultivated your spirituality. All of these made you the unique, never-to-be-repeated person you are. Then you got diagnosed with mental illness. The diagnosis seemed really big, almost like it defined you. Those other parts of you probably seemed smaller or like they had disappeared. When things feel this way, it's really important to remember that you are a person, not an illness. You are not a bipolar or a schizophrenic. You are more than that. All those parts of you are still there. You are not an illness. You are the one who is strong enough to make your journey of recovery. And you will need to mobilize and depend on all of these amazing parts of yourself in order to make your journey into the life you want for yourself. Your spirituality is still there to guide you. The people you love and people that you will meet along the way will be there to support you. Your work and school and hobbies will help you heal as you make your passage. And don't give up your hopes and dreams. They are the stars that will guide you as you navigate your recovery. Your diagnosis does not define you. It's just one aspect of the wonderful person you are. 
You can live your life, not your diagnosis. Now, try taking a deep breath in through your nose. And when you are ready, slowly exhale. Congratulations, you are on your way. And as a little gift to you, I have um, included both in Spanish and in English a worksheet that allows you and your loved one or the person that uh, you're working with um, or your peer allows you to, to think through uh, your flower story, as we call it, right? Uh, how I understood myself before the diagnosis, how I understood myself after the diagnosis, and how am I going to use my, my story um, to help others understand me and to inspire others. I've been to uh, places where folks have worked on these things together in peer settings and then cut out all these gorgeous flowers that are all over the room with people's flower story, their, their, their story of their sea rose, um, you know, uh, all over the room. So I love this stuff. So consider using it. Uh, and a final, final meme for you. The goal of recovery is not to become normal. The goal of recovery is to become the unique, never to be repeated gift that we are. And I'm hoping uh, if I don't get to see you again, that you can uh, stay up to date on all of our social media channels. Um, and I would love to hear um, some uh, questions, uh, thoughts. Um, where are you at? What'd you think? Let me know. Thank you so much, Pat. That was an amazing presentation. And if anyone does have any questions, please utilize the raise hand feature if you want to ask Pat directly, or you could put it in the chat. I just want to say thank you so much, Pat, um, for joining us. This was a lovely way to start the week. We might need you to come back every Monday. It's going to be a great week, and we are more than excited to start the implementation of personal medicine. I really think it's going to be wonderful um, for the members in our system and just what we need. So I am more than thrilled, and thank you so, so much for this morning. It was really meaningful and powerful. Great. Yes, definitely. John, um, you are unmuted. Go ahead, please. John Larsala. Pat, thank you very much for that presentation. You're welcome. I have one question. Mm -hmm. What happened to the medications that you were on? I think that what, well, I know what happened was that um, as my self-care increased, I felt more and more confident um, reducing uh, my uh, psychiatric medications with my um, psychiatrist. And so together, we would slowly start tapering the antipsychotic medications. Um, and, uh, but I, what I found that is there's a lot of challenges in slowly coming off. So as my psychiatric meds were coming down, my personal medicine, I had to increase, increase, increase. You see? And I think that finding that right balance between the medications I use and the, um, per my personal medicine became the pathway into my recovery. Today, I'm not using any psychiatric medications, and it's taken me very, very long time to get here, and it feels great. And I did that work uh, with my psychiatric care provider over, over uh, a number of years. And I, I tried and failed a few times, too, to get off. And then I tried um, uh, going off all by myself and, uh, you know, very abruptly. And uh, like I like to say, it's, uh, it's really easy to go off medicines. You just throw them away. <laughs> Uh, the hard part is going off meds and staying well. So I learned that the, the hard way, and uh, but uh, I think many of us do. Uh, but today is all good, and um, I have a whole new course uh, called Medication Empowerment, which is a way of thinking about using meds and dealing with questions about coming off and all of that stuff, and it's really exciting work. Maybe someday I'll get to bring it to Arizona. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, any other questions in the? We have one in the chat from Dennis. Um, can you talk a little bit about aftercare's importance in long term recovery and why do we not have more aftercare communities in your point of view? I guess I'm not sure how in Arizona aftercare is defined. Could somebody help me understand that and I can comment? Dr. Pat, thank you for 
your openness and your vulnerability and the love that undergirded all of what you presented. It was a beautiful presentation. When I speak of aftercare, I speak of um, recovery uh, initially as something that's addressed as a crisis. And then there's some amount of stabilization short term. And then often what happens um, is people are finding themselves, they find themselves kind of after that initial care in the same old swamp of relationships that put them in the place that got them where they are you know, now. And so aftercare in the view that we have at Recovery Cafe is about creating a space, a community where people can come together and get the loving support and the walking beside that you speak so uh, eloquently of. And so I'm just kind of curious about your thoughts regarding that and its importance in long-term stability and recovery. Thank you so much. Sure, sure, thanks for the question. No, I think that, you know, it's almost an oxymoron after care because the care has to continue, right? And it's reestablishing new and more vital networks of care, uh, more vibrant networks of care in and through peer connections, in and through family and friends, if you have any, um, and and continuing to transform our lives by creating new connection. And connection so often, I think healing connection is not just about being helped, but discovering that I too can help um, and that I have something to give back, that I'm more than a quote unquote consumer. I've always struggled with that word. It conjures a large orifice, which tends to just consume, right? But part of the huge part of healing is being able to give back and discover that I'm not broken, therefore I don't need to be fixed, but that through mutuality and true reciprocity, life is about a give and take relationship with others. And it can be healing to discover that that uh, that uh, those of us who've been wounded can also reach out and support others, reach across and, and support others. So yeah, I think highly of, um, of uh, some, some of the uh, crisis uh, programs that I've seen where uh, the care continues to evolve after the emergency because so often, um, you know, going back, you know, as, as one person says, what does it mean to recover um, with a spirit of hope when I return to a completely hopeless community in which no one's working and nobody has a job and in which poverty is rampant and, and racism is uh, so stressful? And it's a great, great uh, point of being able to develop hope that's tangible for that pathway into the life I want. That's what that's what we really got to get good at. Asking from day one, what's the life you want and how can I help you get there? Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. It looks like we have maybe about five more minutes to take a couple more questions. Uh, I was saying thank you so much. I have um, learned a lot from Pat and um, my question is, the paperwork that she's using, whether we can use it as a model um, in helping some of our members in terms of tra training, encouragement, and um, to work together with them so that we don't be the other person who thinks this is what she needs and that's really not what she needs. Well, if I understood correctly, yes, Please use the resources that I'm sharing with you today. Uh -huh. um, and uh, I know they say copyright on them and stuff, but you have my verbal permission to, of course, use them um, with folks. And, um, you know, it can sometimes be challenging when somebody says, I need this, and the treatment team says, well, you know, you know, you don't, you need all this other stuff, right? Uh -huh. uh, and I think that going back to that question, you know, what matters to you? How, uh, you know, paint for me. Uh, First of all, what, what do you already know how to do that helps with some of the distress that you're experiencing? And then let's let's look at the life that you want and then think, figure out how we're going to help you get there. Mm -hmm. That I think is the, the is where we find the common ground. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Pat. It looks like we have one last question. Would you recommend any strategies to help provider organizations move from a maintenance model of care to a recovery model of care? I, I think there are many good uh, tools, um, systematic tools for uh, systems transformation uh, and transformation of service systems. Um, and I would encourage you, I, I think we can talk to a blue in the face. And frankly, you know, this is going to be very humbling to tell you, but, but that, you know, when, when 
uh, researchers look at the issue of when, when we presented, however good a speaker we've had, when we look at what's the actual transfer into practice tomorrow, what of these ideas actually get done? What happens is the, the transfer rate is very, very low, right? People need more than inspirational talks. What they need are tools uh, and supervisors who are deeply trained in these tools um, who can model um, the practice of recovery oriented work. And we know this through implementation science, right? And so, um, for instance, it's, you know, we know that, for instance, the evidence based practice of individual placement and support or supported employment uh, works with fairly, um, you know, predictable outcomes uh, if we can uh, maintain fidelity to the model um, and train in it and keep it alive in our organization so that, so that it becomes the culture of the organization. There are other good practices, like on my website, if you go to patdegan.com, we have entire academies for personal medicine, medication empowerment. Um, I think where most staff really get stuck is around the whole issue of choice and self-determination. Um, and so we have a whole academy class that staff can take um, around, okay, how do I support choice when it seems like someone's making a choice that's steering their lives away from recovery? So there are lots and lots of good um, tools out there. I'm a believer in tools, tools that reinforce recovery-oriented practice as I use them, right? So something like personal medicine, right? Or something like my medication empowerment program, supported employment is filled with all these tools that we can use. So words are not enough. They're important, but they're not enough. Uh, we need tools that in, and so select some tools, get them in the hands of your workforce, incentivize use of the tools, make sure your supervisors are modeling the use of the tools. Um, and so that it becomes part of the culture of the organization is, is what we know works for implementing um, and, and, and making a, a culture shift in the organization. Thank you guys again so much. Um, you can follow us at Mercy Care AZ on all of the major social medias. Um, and we just appreciate you guys for attending today. Have a great afternoon. And Pat, thank you so much uh, for your speech. And uh, it was very impactful and powerful for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.